What would you do if you were in the middle of the desert with a bottle of water and there is no water source for miles around and someone said, you can have all the water you want if you simply pour the water out. How many would do that? That seem a little risky? That seems a little risky. Well, there is a story about a letter that was found in a baking powder can wired to the handle of an old pump out in the middle of Nevada's Armagosa Desert. It's a very long, seldom-used trail, and this water pump was the only water source. And the note said, this pump is all right as of June 1932. I realize this was a long time ago. I put a new sucker washer into it, and it ought to last five years. But the washer dries out, and the pump has got to be primed. Under the white rock, I buried a bottle of water out of the sun, cork end up. There's enough water in it to prime the pump, but not if you drink some first. Pour about one-fourth and let her soak to wet the leather. Then pour in the rest, medium fast, and pump like crazy. You'll get water. The well has never run dry. Have faith. When you get watered up, fill the bottle and put it back like you found it for the next feller. Signed, Desert Pete. P.S. Don't go drinking the water first. Prime the pump with it and you'll get all you can hold. How many would do that? If you're within 1937, okay? Because he said it should be good for five years. If you're in that time frame, I mean, it takes a lot of faith to surrender the only bottle of water you have. But if you have faith and you surrender it, you'll have all the water you need. You'll have an abundance of water. Our theme for 2023 is abundance. And we are doing a series on faith right now. We're learning what faith is. The reason we're studying faith is because Hebrews chapter eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And for us to please God better, we need to have a better understanding of faith. So that's what we have been doing. And I, I just want to say um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to thank our online um, audience for being with us today. Also, for those of you who are first-time guests with us here at Radius Church, thank you so much for being with us. We pray that you will learn about faith and maybe walk away with a better understanding than you had before. And if you'd like to catch up on any of our messages on faith that we've done already, you can go to our website, radiuschurch.life. Go to the Watch tab and you can um, catch up on those messages. What we've been doing the past few weeks is taking the letter, the word faith, F-A-I-T-H, using it as an acrostic to learn lessons on faith. So the letter F, we'll just review really quickly for those who haven't been part of us uh, for the past few weeks, or maybe you missed one or two. The letter F stands for, do you remember? Friendship. Yes. Faith is about a friendship that's built on trust in another person. And the person who would be kind of considered the father of the faith, Abraham, he was called a friend of God. We've talked about how faith is about us having a relationship with God. That's always been the aim of faith. Not for you and I to get answers to our prayers, but for you and us to be friends of God. God wants to be your friend. So faith is about this friendship. The letter A in faith stands for all things are possible. God can do anything, anywhere, at any time, in any way. Now at the same time, his omnipotence is, coincides with his sovereignty, his character, and his promises. And there are times when God does things that don't make sense, Times when it might seem like he's being cruel or mean, but what we need to do in those situations is have faith because faith receives what God gives. Faith receives what God gives. The example we gave was Dan, um, Dan, in the book of Daniel, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we believe God can do all things. God can rescue us from this fire, fi uh, this fiery furnace. King, we're not going to bow down and worship your God. But even if God doesn't, we're still going to have faith in him. 
we're still going to have faith in God. Faith receives what God gives, even though God can do anything, we trust in his sovereignty and his goodness. The letter I in faith stood for it inspires action. Faith inspires action. It inspires us to take initiative. Faith without works is dead. It extends beyond belief. If faith doesn't move you to action, you don't have real faith. Our faith, when we start a friendship with Jesus, it should change us. We should be different than what we were before. And so faith should result in a different life, a changed life, a life that doesn't deny reality. We don't deny reality, our situations. We acknowledge them, but we believe God can do anything and we're going to act in faith and do the right things because they're the right things to do because we're trusting God. Okay, let's take a look at the letter T this morning. What does the letter T stand for when it comes to faith? It stands for total surrender. Total surrender, not partial surrender, not 99%, but total surrender. When I use the word surrender, when I say surrender, what comes to mind? Defeat. Giving up. How many see the image of waving a white flag? Yeah, that's what we think of when we think of surrender. The, the definition of surrender is the act of giving up or yielding oneself or the possession of something to another. And in the context of the world, surrender is a bad thing. Surrender is giving up. It is losing. It's I concede, you win, I lose. Surrender is a bad thing. But how many know in God's economy, God's economy is always reversed. God's economy is the opposite of what the world's economy is. We see it in Acts 20, 35, when it says it's more blessed to give than to receive. We see it in Mark 8, 35, when it says whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. We see the opposite economy in Mark 9, 35. Anyone who desires to be first... He shall be last and be the servant of all. God's economy is always opposite ours. And so instead of surrender being a loss, surrender is a gain. In your notes this morning, we have God's definition of surrender, and it's letting go of control. And I want you to circle this in your notes, grabbing hold of God. When you surrender your life, you're not just giving up your control. You're grabbing hold of God and all that he has to offer. The world views surrender as a loss. In God's economy, surrender is a game. We, we open up ourselves to God's person, God's plan, God's power, and God's provision. And I don't know about you, but those are for, four pretty good things to grab a hold of. How many want to grab a hold of God's person and be in his presence? How many want his plan for your life? How many want his power for your life to fulfill that plan? How many want his provision for the plan? You have that only as you surrender. Surrender is a gain when it comes to God and when it comes to faith. I want to share several biblical examples of people who surrendered their life. They says, God, I'm giving up. And look what they gained. When Moses surrendered at the burning bush, he was a prince who did a lot of miracles in Egypt, by the way. That sounds like a kid's movie night, doesn't it? Yeah, anyway. When he surrendered at the burning bush, he led a nation out of slavery of over two, point, uh, over two million people. He did incredible miracles. He probably did the most incredible miracles, more miracles than anyone outside of Jesus. Moses was a powerful man of God as he surrendered at the burning bush. Esther, when she surrendered her life, she became the queen of Persia. When Rahab surrendered her life, she escaped the destruction of Jericho and also a life of prostitution. She gained a great husband and became the great, 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 great grandmother of King David and was also included in the lineage of Jesus Christ. When Mary surrendered to God, she became the mother of the Son of God. When Paul surrendered on the Damascus Road, he was appointed to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and he launched Christianity to the Gentiles, which is still having an impact on us today. 
And he wrote half of the New Testament, which is still having an impact on us in the entire world today. Friends, when you surrender to God, you have no idea where he's going to take you, what he's going to do through you. I encourage you to have faith, which means totally surrender to God. Is there anything that is more important to you than God? Because if you do have something that's more important, then you will find it impossible to surrender to him. What does surrender look like? Turn to Genesis 22. We're going to take a look at Genesis 22 this morning. And it's a story of Abraham and his son Isaac. Now, Isaac was the son of promise. God had told Abraham, uh, I encourage you, maybe read sometime today or this week, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15. In those two chapters, God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless all the world through you, through your descendants. I'm going to give you a son. His name's going to be Isaac. I'm going to make a covenant with you. You're going to be this great nation. I'm going to do all these awesome things. And it stalled for years and years and years. Abraham doesn't have a son. Finally, when he's 100 years old, he has Isaac, his son. But now in Genesis 22, God is going to do something that's going to put all those plans, all those promises, the covenant he made with Abraham, it looks like he's killing the covenant. It looks like he's putting to death the promises. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 it came to pass about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. He says, sacrifice your son and not just sacrifice him, but it's a burnt offering. Torch his body. I want that to sink in a moment. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Abraham, I'm probably saying, okay, wait a second, God. Can you repeat that? I, 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 I don't think I heard you right. I had bad pizza last night. That's what it was. I mean, what? I mean, Abraham is in this quandary. Isaac is the son of promise. All these blessings, all the plans of God, the promises of God are on him. And God says, kill him and burn him. Now, I just need to say a couple things. First of all, if God says that to you nowadays, you don't do that. You know why? Because we have the Ten Commandments that say, thou shalt not kill. The Ten Commandments had not been given yet until Moses over 400 years later so that's one reason for that. But secondly, God never intended to have Abraham kill Isaac. It says he was testing him. God wanted to know what was most important in his life. And that brings us to our first sign of surrender in your notes this morning. The first sign of surrender is that God is first no matter what. God is first no matter what. God had promised Abraham all these things through Isaac. And so now, what's more important to you, Abraham? The promises of God? The plans of God? Your dreams? Your hopes? Or obeying what God says in this moment? Oswald Chambers, in a devotional book he has, it's called My Utmost for His Highest, he talks about surrender. And he says, Beware of surrender that's motivated by personal benefits that may result. Our motive for surrender should not be for any personal gain at all. We have become so self-centered that we go to God only for something from Him and not for God Himself. It's like saying, No, Lord, I don't want you. I want myself. But I want you to clean me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be on display in your showcase so I can say, this is what God has done for me. Gaining heaven, being delivered from sin, and being made useful to God are things that should never even be a consideration in real surrender. Genuine total surrender is a personal, sovereign preference for Jesus Christ himself. Now he's saying, the reason I surrender my life to God isn't to get to heaven. 
That's not why I surrender. I surrender for God and God alone. There are no benefits that I'm seeking. Not heaven, not peace, not comfort, not victory over an addiction, not deliverance, not help, not anything. I just want a relationship with God. That friendship, that's what I want. That's why I surrender to God because I want God more than anything God can do for me. So my question for us as we look at this sign of surrender, is there anything more important? Am I willing to say, God, the, if I got nothing more from you if, you, if I lost everything like Job, would having you be enough? Are you first and foremost and only in my life? Are you what I want more than anything? That's the first sign of surrender, the first thing each of us needs to ask ourselves this morning. What's interesting is, God, in his goodness and his greatness, he gives us so much more than just a relationship with us. How many have found God to bless you? God to do more than you have asked for. I have found that on so many occasions. But there are times that God doesn't always give us blessings and give us what we want. In Hebrews chapter 11, write this down in your notes. And I encourage you, maybe read this sometime this week. Hebrews 11 is called the Faith Hall of Fame. It lists all these people that did great things for God. And when you get to the, near the latter part of the chapter, um, the author says, I'm running out of time to tell you about Gideon, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the other prophets. And in verse 39, he says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. So up to this point, he's listing all these great supernatural interventions God has done, all these miracles that have taken place. But now, as we continue to read, notice without skipping a beat, with not changing the tense, with not stopping anything, he kind of shifts to a second group of people. And take a look at what he says about these. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, and were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith. All of these, the people that saw the miracles... And the people that did not see the miracles, the ones who suffered that were sawn in two, that died with the sword. Well, you see, God, when he looks at people of great faith, there are sometimes he does incredible blessings and sometimes there is incredible suffering. But these people totally surrendered their life to God and saying, God, not my will, your will. What do you want done? It's all about you, God not about what I want. That's the first sign of surrender, is that God is first. Amen. All right, let's look at number two. The second sign of surrender is immediate obedience. Immediate obedience. In verse 3, going back to Genesis and Abraham, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. You know, Abraham obeyed immediately. And even he's thinking ahead, what do I need to do this? It's a burnt offering. I need the wood. You know, he, he could have said, well, I'll just see if there's any wood there. God will provide the wood. But no, he wanted to make sure he could go all in on what God had told him. Not making any excuses. Well, God, I can only slam, but I can't burn him up. You know, he was totally following God and he immediately obeyed. There's no arguing. It's not like, okay, God, let's do rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three. Okay, best two out of three, God. You know, 
He didn't do that. He, he didn't try to act like a car salesman. You know, you ever, how many have ever dickered for a car before? You know, you try to do and get the best price. No, there's none of that. There's no haggling. There is, yes, God. He had immediate obedience. This last Sunday, and actually it started on Saturday in our Champions Men's Group, um, one of the points in there we were talking about is living a generous life. And I found myself coming out of the study saying, God, help me to, have, to be a more generous person. Give me opportunities for generosity. And on Sunday, I had to run to Walmart, get some things that we needed for the week. And as I'm pulling up to the west side Walmart, there's an intersection there um, once you get off the main road. And at the corner, there were all these people, and they were holding signs, raising money for a new wheelchair, $25,000. And I felt God prompt me to give him $20. But I, I really didn't see the sign until I was right up on it, and there was cars behind me. And it's like, I can't stop and get the money out now, so I'll do it on my way back. So I drove into the parking lot went in the store, got all my stuff, came back. And as I'm driving, I remember, oh yeah, I want to give them money. But then I start thinking, wait a second. What if these guys are really scamming people? I mean, because they did have a little kid in a wheelchair on the corner sitting there, but it's like, well, maybe that kid doesn't need the wheelchair. What if they're, I mean, and you put 25000 because, you know, people are going to give a lot when you've got to raise 25 th What if they're just trying to rip people off? What if they're a bunch of phonies and just, you know, using a little kid? And I, I'm thinking that the whole time when I pull up to the intersection, I don't have my money, and I, I drive through the intersection, and I'm going, I don't know if I should. And it's like, well, it's too late to stop now. And as soon as I got past him, I'm going, I, I, it's like I heard God say, you're supposed to give him the $20. And I'm going, well, I'm on my way home. I'm already past them. And I'm driving a little bit, and I'm going, I just need to obey God. So I went down the block, made a right turn, came around, got out my $20, gave it to him, and went home. Now, I didn't see anyone saved. I didn't see anything, but here's the thing. I should have obeyed immediately. I should have drove into the parking lot, pulled over the very first time, got the money, walked out, gave it to him, and then got back in. Because here's the thing, if you delay when God says obey, most likely you'll talk yourself out of it. Most likely you'll talk yourself out of it. Now I'm not saying being stupid, I'm saying when you know God has spoken to you, how do you know when God's spoken to you? Well, there's a few things. First of all, everything should line up with Scripture. All right? If God says, kills your only son Isaac nowadays, no, you don't do that. That doesn't line up with Scripture. Also, sometimes it's good to get wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Now, I didn't call my wife on there because it wasn't a real, you know, $20 does not going to change my life. Then also, do you have a peace of God about it? Does God give you a peace? Those are three little things, the peace of God, the people of God, wisdom in a multitude of counselors, and the principles of God. Peace, people, principles. Really easy way to remember how to know if God's talking to you. But if you don't obey immediately, you'll probably find some reason not to obey. So the sign of surrender, of total surrender, is immediate obedience. It's putting God first. Number three, the third sign of surrender is continued obedience. It's continued obedience. Take a look at verse 4 of Genesis 22. On the what day? What day does it say? The third day. On the third day, I think we went ahead to chapter 5, verse 4 says, On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Do you realize when God said go to Mount Moriah, it's not like it was just a quick trip. It was going to take three days to get there. I bet those were the longest three days of Abraham's life. How would you feel... If God told you, I want you to sacrifice your child, but you have to go to Washington, D.C., and that's going to be a big three-day drive to get to D.C., how would you feel over those three days? Would you have some sleepless nights? You know, I, what was going through Abraham's mind? But he just, every day, every footstep, he just continued to obey God. He continued walking in that direction of obedience. He did not stop 
He did not let his fear, he did not let any anxiety, he did not let maybe any frustration with why is God doing this. He did not let his questions stop him from obeying God. He continually surrendered to the Lord. Let's keep reading verse 5. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. And listen to this. We will worship and return to you. You see the faith he has? He knows what he's going to do. I'm going to sacrifice my son and burn him. But he tells the men, we will return to you. He has faith that God is going to do a miracle. It goes on to say, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. So Isaac is carrying the wood that he's going to be laying on pretty soon. He took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place which God had told them. Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad. And do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. As you go on and read the story, there's a ram in a thicket. God says, sacrifice the lamb. They do. And everything's great. But here's the thing. Abraham didn't know that there was a ram in the thicket. He never saw it. He was willing to continue to surrender and obey God because God was first place in his life. How about for us? Has God spoken to us about surrendering our lives, about surrendering everything? And is there anything we're saying, God, you can have this, you can have that, you can have this, but you can't have my future. You can't have my job, my salary. You can't have my spouse if she's sick. You can't have my kids. God, there are certain things I'll give you, but I'm not surrendering that. Total surrender puts God first, God immediately, and God continually. You see, surrender is not a one-time act. It's a continual lifestyle that our lives are living sacrifices being offered to God for His plans and His purposes, even when they seem like they are breaking those plans and purposes that He's given us before. Abraham was willing to die to the promise God had given him, the promise of Isaac. That's total surrender. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like giving up on God, God hasn't answered your prayers for healing from sickness or for God saving your kids, for God doing a miracle in your family. Maybe your struggle is more of an internal one. You deal with depression on a continual basis. Or maybe there's an addiction that has control of your life. Are you willing to surrender everything to God and say, God, no matter what happens, I want you more than anything? You see, faith, and this is in your notes, faith is a total surrender of every area at all times. Faith is a total surrender in every area at all times. Ken Davis is a Christian comedian, and he tells about in college, he was supposed to give a speech that would demonstrate a principle and do it in a creative and a memorable way. So he taught about the law of the pendulum. And he taught how in a pendulum, because of gravity and friction, wherever you start it at, when it goes and it comes back, it will never go as far as where it started. And each time it goes, it will just keep getting shorter and shorter till it comes to a point of equilibrium and it doesn't move anymore. 
And after he taught that for about 20 minutes, all the physics and science behind it, he put a top, uh, a children's toy top, and he put it on to the top of the blackboard, and then he drew a mark, a chalk mark, where it started, and he let it go. And every time the, the top came back, he drew another mark. He just kept doing it. About, it took about a total minute, and you could see every time when the top came back, it did not touch the next line. And um, at the end of his presentation, he says, how many of you believe in the law of the pendulum, that the pendulum will not go back as far or farther than where it started, where it previously was? Everyone in the class, including the teacher, raises their hand. The teacher walks up to the classroom thinking the lesson is over, but the lesson was just getting started. Because what Ken had done earlier is he went into the classroom on a ladder he took 250 pounds of metal weights with four parachute cords, 500-pound parachute cords, and tied them to the steel rafters in the ceiling. And then he revealed them, brought them down from the ceiling. He had his teacher come sit up on a chair on top of the desk with his head up against the concrete wall. And he said to the teacher, he said, Do you believe in the law of the pendulum? Sweats forming on the teacher's brow. And he whispers, yes. Ken brings the 250 pounds an inch away from the teacher's nose. And he says to the class, if the law of the pendulum is true, then these weights will not even come close to the teacher's nose. He lets them go. The weights fly across to one side of the room. They stop. And they begin to sway back. And as they're coming back, never in your life did you see a man move so fast. Ken then asked the class, does the teacher believe in the law of the pendulum? No! You know, it's easy to surrender your life when you're dealing with a toy top. Oh, that's, yeah, I believe in that. 250 pounds flying in your face. That's when uh, I have a hard time with that, God. I have a hard time with that. So how do we surrender? How do we surrender to God? I'm going to give you three quick steps. They're there in your notes this morning. And they might sound a little familiar if you've been with us the last three weeks. The first step to come into a place of total surrender to God is you believe God is your friend. You believe God is your friend. Psalm 143, verse 8 says, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you I do trust. You see, if I hear God's loving kindness, if I know he's good, if I know he's my friend, if I know he's faithful, then I can trust him. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. I offer up my soul. I surrender my soul to you. If we believe that God is good, that God is loving, that God cares for us, that God wants to be our friend, if we believe he's our friend, then that makes it easier to surrender to him. If we believe that God doesn't like us, that God has it out for us, that he's not good, that he's unfaithful, it's going to be impossible to totally surrender. So you've got to believe God is your friend. The second step to surrender is you believe all things are possible. That's what we talked about in week two. All things are possible. When you read that Hebrews chapter 11 hall of faith in verse 17 and 19, it talks about Abraham in this very same story that we read in Genesis 22. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abram believed that if I kill Isaac and I burn him, God can bring him totally back, his body back together, and then bring that body to life. He believed all things were possible. So believe that God is your friend and God can do anything. He can do all things. Number three, the third step to surrender is that you're willing to initiate action while being honest with God. 
We've got to be willing to initiate action, to do what God asks us to do, while at the same time being honest with Him. Faith, remember we said last week, doesn't deny reality. If you're struggling with something God has said to you, be honest. Jesus is our model for this. In Matthew 26, it's a parallel passage of Mark 14 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago when we talked about faith. But it has a couple of interesting details that the Mark passage didn't include. And I want to start reading in verse 36. Then Jesus came with them, his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. That would be James and John. And Jesus began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Notice that as Jesus begins praying, he doesn't hide his emotions from God. Okay? He pours out his distress, this anguish, this pressure, this sorrow. He lets God see it. He's not hiding it. Verse 38, Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then Jesus goes back to his disciples. He finds them sleeping. He rebukes them. And then he goes to pray again. And in verse 42, again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Doesn't that sound very similar to what he prayed the first time? Yeah, very similar. Verse 43, he came and found them asleep again for their eyes were heavy. So he left them. He went away again. He prayed the, same, the third time, saying the same words. Friends, Jesus prayed three times, God, I don't want to go through this. God, I don't want to suffer like this. God, Please, if there's any way, get me out of this situation. If we can accomplish salvation for mankind some other way, let's do it. I don't want to do this. He prayed once. He prayed it again. He prayed it again. Jesus was being honest with God. Friends, God can handle your doubts. God can handle your questions. God can handle your anger and your frustration. He wants to be your best friend. You tell your best friend everything. My wife, she knows practically everything. My armor bearer, I share almost everything with him. You bear your soul to your best friend. God wants you to be honest with him. Some of us, God has asked us to do things, but we're fighting him and we're holding things in our heart, not letting go of our fear. We're trying to be in control. God says, give me your fear. Give me your questions. Give me your doubt. Give me your anger. Give me your discouragement. Give me your depression. Whatever it is you have, give it to me. God wants to be your friend. So be honest with him. And in the midst of being honest, be willing to take the action that God says. Not my will but your will be done. I'm going to close with uh, this story. One night a house caught on fire and there was a little boy who had to scramble up to the top of the roof because there was no way down and the flames were on fire. He's on top of the roof and his father is down below and he sees his son in the, up in the shadows and he says, Son, jump to me, I'll catch you. Now realize, it's pitch dark, you've got tons of smoke from the fire, and the boy's outline was illuminated, but the boy could not see his father. The father could see the boy, but the boy could not see his dad. And he says, but dad, I can't see you! And the father says, that doesn't matter. I see you, and I'll catch you. Friends, you maybe can't see God in this moment in what you're going through right now. But that doesn't matter because God sees you and he'll catch you. You just have to jump. You just need to surrender whatever it is that God is tugging on your heart saying, it's time to give this to me. Let's pray this morning. 
Oh, Father God, I thank you that you see us and you know every detail about us, what we're going through, even the things we've hidden and haven't been honest about. You've seen every tear and every fear. You know the struggle that each one of us is wrestling with in this room. Those watching online, you know what it is, Father God. You're our friend. You can do all things. I pray in these next few moments, we'll be honest with you and we will surrender anyone or anything. What do you need to surrender to God in this moment? Maybe it's a bad report from the doctor. Are you willing to say, God, I want you more than I want healing? Maybe it's a grave financial crisis. Maybe you've lost your marriage or you've lost a loved one. Are you willing to say, God, I want you more than I want help in this situation more than I want that relationship back? Maybe your struggle is something on the inside. Maybe you're dealing with an addiction. What if you're never set free from the addiction? Now, I know we would all like to be set free, but what if you're not? Are you willing to say, God, I'll take you even if I'm never set free or if I never overcome this depression, this discouragement that always seems to have a grip on me? What if it's something dealing with your kids? And your kids, you don't ever see them come back to Christ. They walked away. Are you willing to say, God, I want you more than I want what you can do for my family? This morning, God is speaking to several of us about different situations, about things that you need to surrender. There might be some of you, God's been calling you to... In, Go into full-time ministry to be a pastor, to be a missionary. Maybe some of you are students in school. And you says, but God, I don't want to do that. God, I want to be rich. I want to get a career I can get my... I don't want to do that. Maybe some of you, you're an adult and God's been knocking on your heart saying, hey, it's time to change gears. I'm calling you to this area of ministry, but you don't want to give up your position, your wealth, your prestige. What is God asking you to surrender this morning? Are you willing to totally give it to God? This morning with no one looking around, how many would say God's been knocking on my heart saying, I want you to surrender this. And he's pointed something in your life you need to surrender to him. Just put your hand up today. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for your honesty. Maybe some of you are saying, I want to. You want to put your hand up, but you're fighting right now. You're like me at that intersection. If you delay, if you don't do it now, I can guarantee you probably won't do it when you walk out of here. You'll talk yourself out of it. And you, if you're afraid, just begin to say, God, I'm afraid to surrender. Is there anyone else today you'd say, I need to surrender something to God. I need total surrender. Just lift your hand if you need a total surrender to God. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Those of you watching online, if God's speaking to you, I just encourage you wherever you at, raise your hand saying, God, I'm surrendering to you. There are some of you here today that you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. You haven't surrendered your soul. That is the most important thing you can surrender to God is your soul. And to realize that you have sinned against God. All of us have sinned against God. You know what's interesting is that God said go to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the mount in Jerusalem where Jesus was sacrificed. The very place God said to Isaac, sacrifice your son. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He slayed his son so that you can have a relationship with God and be forgiven of your sin. If you're here this morning or you're watching online, I'd like you just to raise your hand if you're saying, I need to get right with God. I haven't been following God. I haven't surrendered my life. Thank you. I see that hand. Anyone else today? Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Thank you. Thank you. There in the back. Anyone else today? 
If you're online and God's speaking to your heart, just raise your hand, put it up wherever you're watching us this morning. I'm going to say this prayer. I would like each of us to repeat after me. God, I know I have sinned. I've held on to control of many things in my life. I want you more than any blessings, more than your promises, more than my dreams, more than your answers to my prayers. I surrender my life I commit myself to you wholeheartedly and I will continue to lay my life down and follow you. Amen. Amen.